that's your first reading, very first name, your cell by yourself. You look through that and you digest what's in there. So I'll tell you. I must say that you've been in prison, and that was all right. So everything I'm telling you about here, Amaius, you would go through the same process. You would be first on the day of your release from prison, you'd be brought out of the cells over there, brought through this door here, into here, and you would discard your prison uniform, have a shower, pick up your outside clothing, your jewellery, etc., and you'd be taken over to the front of the gate, and you'd be officially discharged from the prison at 10 o'clock in the morning. In the main prison. Would you mind closing the door? You can close that one as well, thanks. Yeah. Just bang it closed. Yeah, but not as deep. <laughs> That's true, but longer. Just have a look around you. Does it look like a prison? Yes. <laughs> You wouldn't sort of mistake it stumbling in the dark, you wouldn't think it was a Hilton or something like that, would you? <laughs> now, now, this Swan River Colony in WA, nine, Adelaide didn't exist. Now that in Melbourne, now that in Brisbane, no Gold Coast, but Sydney existed as a convict colony. This one came about as a free colony. To be granted land here, you had to have your own internal workforce to be able to be given land and work it. But between 1829 and 1848, there were still less than 4,600 people in the whole of this state. That's a long time, there wasn't many people. And they had no labour force to build roads or anything like that. So a group of them got together and lobbied the English government to have convicts sent here as well as to New South Wales. Now in those days in England, the English had so many convicts they didn't know what to do with them. So they were only too pleased to say, yes, yes, how many would you like? How quickly would you like them and when? How many? <laughs> so the first ones arrived here in 1850, in here in this state, on a boat called the Cindian. 75 arrived here. The last ones came here in 1868. So in that 18 years, 10,000 English male convicts came to this state. Now the majority of these 4,600 people didn't want them to come here, but it was the vocal minority, the politicians, the merchants and the farmers who said yes we want. So that they overruled changed. the majority, no, just like it changed. is today, you know? Yeah, this is... That's how they got their own. And there were major, major problems when they first started arriving. Of course, when they logged here in 1850, the prison wasn't here. By 1852, they cut, this place was chosen because this was a hill of limestone. You see the broad white line on the wall? See that rock formation? That's limestone. Now that was that height. All limestone. All the way through here. And that's what they cut away in the blocks on site to build the prison. They started cutting it up in blocks in 1850. By 1852, they had enough blocks to start building from this point. So they started there in 1852, <coughs> by 1855 they got to the middle. See the date on the top? Oh, yeah. That's why that's the date's 18. Just the longest prison block in the southern hemisphere. The block in the far corner is New Division. That's built out of limestone too. Limestone came from, from Rottnest Island. And that red brick building sticking, sticking over the wall all by itself, that was the female section after 1970, when it closed down because they built a prison in Bandia up in the middle swan area. Back to modern times, here at the back where this lime wash is and the lines where the brickwork was, we had bird cages there. We started holding, it became a sort of a bird sanctuary. They, they looked after sick and injured birds and nursed them back to health. And also they provided a service for people outside the prison. If you're going to go and leave for an extended period and you had birds in your backyard, or budgies or whatever, you could bring them in here and they put them in the cages here and look after them for you until you came back from there. Free, a free thing it was. It was, it was sort of crims doing something for you instead of nicks and stuff off you. They were given something back. So that was encouraged. The area above that where the guard houses. 
do them because we've been here. Just in, into this division. And in here, at one stage, we had juvenile prisoners in here. Juveniles from the age of 13 to 17 were actually held in here. Until the late 1970s when they found a place down in Bunbury Bottom. And then we had remand prisoners in here. These are prisoners who were remanded in custody waiting for sentence. Then we located another place for them to have, and the last group we had here were pedophiles. This is a group of prisoners you have to keep away from everybody. Believe me, you have to. This net above your head was put up in 1920 after a prisoner was pushed. Yeah. 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 This is the these boxes were for various functions. The green one was to put on a list of stuff they had for sale, and the prisoners would mark on that list what they wanted and put the slip into here. The officers would pick up the slips, take them up to the canteen, and make up the bags of stuff that they ordered. They could order extra tobacco, cigarette papers, matches, postage stamps, lollies, toilet psychologists. And the mailbox, prisoners could send out one letter a week paid for by the government. Or as many as they liked if they had their own stamps. But everything they sent out and everything that came in was sensitive. We saw and we read everything that came in. Okay? We had to stop making bread really because the local bakers were kicking out our hell of the we weren't buying bread. Because it was costing us very little to build to, to make bread. You can't really compete with private enterprise, it's their life, so we have to stop and buy the bread from So this became a recreation room for the 23 prisoners who were employed in the kitchen. These guys started at 5 o'clock in the morning and finished at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. 23, and they were responsible for the cooking and the cleaning of this area. Under the guidance of a cook officer instructor and a disciplinary officer. And there's never any problems with food in here because these guys had to cook it and they had to eat what they cooked as well. So it was sort of vetted by them before we went into the rest of the prison. And there are no dining rooms in here. Prisoners ate their meals and locked up in their cells. So you didn't have a big dining room. Because sometimes they had to cook in excess of 600 meals at a time. So you had to be, had to have all the facilities to do that and it had to be run like clockwork. So you could tell them coming in here at any certain time of day exactly what stage they were cooking. Through here was where they um, cleaned fruit and veggies, wet sacks, salad and things. Permanently plugged in a big metal hot pot, a big pain ring. That's how the food was kept hot to be delivered into the division. Here was a butcher shop and a walk-in freezer. At the back there was a couple of proper toilets and a couple of showers. Only been used by the prisoners in here. But that was the only thing we got to use. The board has to turn the corner to the front. Never run out of that commodity. Now, because of this, so isn't here, we also had a prison school. School teacher came in five days a week, and we encouraged these kids to go to school. But not all of them went. Some of them went, some of them didn't. So we never, we never forced them to go because if you force them to go, they just disrupt the ones who were trying to do something. They got paid a little bit more money for going to school than they did if they didn't go to school. So if they got, didn't go to school, they sat here all day, every day. Playing cards, playing checkers, reading comics. They had a daily newspaper come in, and they also had a TV set. Top of that ladder had a TV set. And the channel was usually controlled by who was the biggest idiot in the yard, <laughs> biggest and the strongest in the yard. So whatever he wanted to watch, everybody watched it. <laughs> in the middle of 1991 by certain Aboriginal painters, some of the good painters that were permitted to do. Because prior to that they weren't allowed to touch the wall. There was always a large Aboriginal presence in jail. Always. At least about 60% of the 
prisoners of the Aborigines. Huge population of Aborigines. So they were given special permission. So these paintings are well over 10 years old now. The prison was like this. At quarter to seven in the morning, we sounded a siren at the front gate, which gave prisoners 15 minutes to wake up, get dressed, have their cells clean and tidy, and their beds made. Yeah, and wait until they were called in for breakfast. So when they were called in for breakfast, they'd go in, pick up their breakfast, go into their cells, and they were locked in to have breakfast. They were unlocked again at eight o'clock in the morning, and they came down again from the cell, and they sat under here, and waited until they were allocated to their particular workshops. They went to work until midday. Midday they finished in the workshops, were escorted from the workshops back through here, and sat under here, and they had their midday meal together under there. Midday meal was usually something simple like pies or pasties or sausage roll or something like that. Something you don't need a knife and fork. 12.30, they went back to work again until about quarter to four. Quarter to four, same routine. Left the workshop, escorted from the workshop through here, and they sat under here and waited till they were called in for the afternoon meal. So, when they were called in for afternoon meal, landing by landing, they went into the corner of the yard and they picked the ball and they got to church if they wanted to, and then they put them down while they exercise. They could play tennis here, or basketball with tennis. <laughs> made for my size. <laughs> All these doors are made of corrugated iron. If you're English, you'll know that this was the stuff which you used during the war to make handles and shells. You know the old air raid shells? The windows and the bars outside, all made to fit in England and brought out here on the convict car. And these rails, these were originally ship's rails, taken off derelict boats out here and utilised in here. These projections from the landing here, they were used to hang oil lamps. They used to burn whale oil in those days. Not a very good light. It's probably smelled like a fish and chip shop too. Originally, the prison was built to hold a thousand prisoners. Each cell, each door was a cell. And each cell was only seven foot by four foot in the old measurement. In 1899 they had a royal commission here which declared that the cells were far too small and they ordered that the middle wall inside be taken out to make each two doors one cell. See that's why that's got a lock on it, this one has it because it's the same cell. But it took around about 20 years to get around to doing it. <laughs> Don't move her too quickly in this state. That's what WA stands for, wait a while. Uh, that's true. <laughs> You see how it was constructed, see where it's been painted over the past 1855 that was put up, still standing up. All the timber in the roof is Jarrah. All the Jarrah here came from King's Park originally, from the Mandalizer. These beams are 44 feet across and it's laminated timber. The engineers that you had to strengthen timber by laminating it even in those days. All the windows around are uh, normal glass. They're not being really forced in any way. And the plants you see on the walls, so they change it to murder because murder is illegal killing. Whereas government sanctioned hanging is not. The organ against the wall is over 150. At least half a dozen times a year in here, people book this place for weddings. Yeah, really? Yeah. Be Quite a popular place around Fremont. It looks just like any other church when it's done up. Flowers and the red carpet and the bride and the bridegroom, etc. But, you know, for some minds, it's a bit of a peculiar place to go to. Some people say when you get married, it's like jail. Don't Especially how they get it, they have to go through the way we went, or it's important. When the female prison was operating in here, they had the service the same time as the males. Every second Sunday they had a service as well. So the males would be down here with males and the female prisoners up there with female up there. So they had the service together. And that was as close as they ever got. Fed and locked away. So they'd feed the bottom landing first, put them in their cells, lock the doors, 
Then there's maybe then the next one and the top one. That's the way the routine of the prison is. But this particular day, a mob of prisoners had the exercise down on the right hand side here, rushed through the doors here and grabbed five officers and pulled them into the yard as hostages. And threatened to kill them if we went in to get them. So some of the prisoners actually got into the prison, into the division, up to the top, into the open cells, and took out of the cells bedding and clothing and furniture and set fire to it, burnt a great hole in the roof. One of the officers that was held in the yard of hostage developed a heart problem. And staff in here negotiated with the prisoners in the yard and had been sent in to have treatment. And they swapped him for food because they weren't going to feed him. And the feed the prisoners asked for and received a wheelie bin full to the top with baked beans. <laughs> and another one full of toast. So that's what they had for the evening meal. Nothing wrong with baked beans. <coughs> sure. Sure. Not out of the wheelie bin. No. 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 They tell us it was a very windy night that night. <laughs> the, officer, the officer with the heart problem was released. He came in here, took up the, the, the prison hospital, and he was checked out and he was okay. It eventually took about 18 hours to subdue these prisoners. Now, while I've got you here, we're going to go upstairs on the next landing. You're going to have a look at three different cells. first one is Moondine Joe's cell. This is the one and only bush menu we had in this state. Moon name Joe's full name was John Olitho Johns. He was a Welshman who was convicted in England for stealing from a farmhouse. He stole bread and milk and cheese from a farmhouse and he got 10 years in transportation to Australia. He arrived here in 1853 and by 1855 he was released on what they called ticket of leave, which is a form of parole. He went to work up in the hills, up in the uh, upper swan, up 2J up that way. And eventually he was convicted of stealing a horse up there, and he was locked up again. And he escaped from the regional prisons up there about four times. They got fed up with him right away all the time. So they brought him down here, and, and they made this cell especially for him. This was a seven foot by four foot cell, and they put two inch thick giant planks on the walls to make sure that he couldn't get out. Now this cell became so airproof he couldn't breathe in there during the day. So the surgeon at that time decreed that he should be working within the prison complex. They gave him work near the surgeon's house, which is attached to the front of the prison. And they put one guard in charge of him all the time. The job he had to do was to break up big blocks of limestone into tiny blocks of limestone. Every evening, religiously, they took away the little pile of rubber. After a while, they got slack and the little pile of rubber got bigger and bigger and bigger. Until one day, Joe is working on one side of the pile of rubble <laughs> and the garden on the other side of the pile of rubble. He couldn't see him, but he could hear him working. He was working. He did a great hole, hole in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> took about six to eight weeks and he dug a hole right through the wall. It was only two foot thick. Off again. <laughs> this time he was away for nearly two years. And nearly two years to the day there was a report of a death by drowning up in the hills, up in the rivers where he was. So the police from Perth went up there to investigate and took with them the owner of a vineyard up there, Horton's Wine, which is still up there now. And because they took him because he knew the area very well. They went and they found this body in the river and it wasn't moved up there. On the way back to Perth, the owner of the vineyard said to the police, come back to the vineyard, fellas. We'll have a few jars of wine before we go back. Well, there's not many police in this world who are going to refuse an offer like that. So they went back with him. The old man grabbed his candle and his big jug to get some wine, went underground to get the wine, and he's confronted by a six foot six bloke standing there with a barrel, a ten gallon keg of wine trapped on his front. Mm -hmm. was burned down the day. No. They said a few naughty words to each other. Joe recovered first and bashed the old guy over the shoulder with his stick. He fell over and came handle with him. So Joe calmly walked around him, clutching his barrel of wine, straight to the exit, straight into the arms of the cops, sitting there waiting for their free plunk. So 
So he was arrested again, <coughs> back in this cell, where he lasted another two years before he went completely and utterly insane. He was taken out there and put into the Fremantle Insane Asylum, which is just up the road. And he died three years later in the year 1900. The next cell you're going to see has this big painting of it's a big dock painting done by Aboriginals from the Alice Springs area. Beautiful big painting. And the last cell is called the Artist Cell. The convict who was in there was a bloke called James Walsh. And he was a forger in England. He got 15 years for forging a document that gave him access to food for his family. Now, when he came out here, he still had his pen and his pencils with him for some reason. And he used to draw on the wall. But the trouble was in those days you weren't allowed to do things like that. So after he'd done the drawings, he'd cover the drawings with his issue of porridge. But they couldn't see it. Now eventually he finished all the walls in these drawings. And every three to five years of here, all these walls that would be at the inside were all lime washed to keep the bugs down and to keep them clean. So his walls had the drawings on the wall, covered with a layer of porridge and covered with several layers of wine It wasn't until the 1950s that this cell was being used as a storage cell for boxes and broom buckets and things. One of the prisoners who was clean up on the land, he went in there and accidentally bashed the bucket against the wall. All the plaster fell off and lo and behold, there's these drawings on the wall. It was done in the 1870s. So you can have a look at that. They lived together in a room like this. And after they finished their time here, they were released on what they called ticket of leave, which gave them permission to work outside for multiple wages, but they could not return to England until that ticket of leave portion was finished. So this was a ticket of leave, this is that, an association. You see the hooks in the walls? That's how high up they lived when they were living in here, in the house.
Probably trying to escape a struggle today. <laughs> <laughs> the exhibition that was presented might be the same time as this. Crew of those young people. And, uh, Well, that does look Yard, not to mix with the other prisoners. So they didn't get open this way, they got their own door out that way. <laughs> so they actually catered for transverse storage. <laughs> I was going to go that way. On bread and water. You and I are in this side. Let's sit on the mountain. Where there's a chin mattress and a blanket and a bottle. Now we're going to be 24. So it's a long time. Cells number one and two were held for prisoners who were going to be hanged. In those days, they were held in the death cells over a new division, and on the morning of the hanging, they'd be woken at five o'clock in the morning, taken for a shower, and given a clean prison uniform, and through this division we've just come through, and locked up in number one or number two, for the last two hours of their lives. And in the news, to hang back with, not this particular one, this is the time, the hangman always came from Sydney, because he was the expert. He'd come over here two or three days before the hanging, and he used that two or three days to measure the victim and to weigh him. And they practiced, once they got the weight, they practiced with these bags of rock to get the right drop. Because heavier people don't have to drop as far as lighter people. See? On the morning of the hanging, which was always at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning, no work would commence, commence in the prison until after the hanging. Five to eight, the prisoner would be brought out at number one or number two to this door here. Outside there, they put a calico hood over his head so he didn't actually see the noose. He'd be led into here by the hangman, and these doors were up. He'd be put into here, 
and the hangman would put the rope around his neck and adjust it to exactly where he wanted it, with the knot at the back. Many people in here were the hangman, superintendent of the prison, the uh, surgeon and the chaplain, and four guards. These heavy duty pants here on the left, one was put on each side of the lever, and in the corner, in each corner stood an officer. And his sole job was to stand close to the person going to be hanged and able to hold him up like that. So if he rocked towards you, you pushed him so he stood up straight. But he had to drop straight through. If he was unable to stand at all, that was what the chair was for him. Put on a chair and hang from the chair. So, first stroke of the clock at the front gate, 8 o'clock. That would open the doors and he'd fall through. So that would be the last sound you would hear. We should let them hang for between 7 to 15 minutes. Then the body was lowered right down to the ground, checked by the surgeon, and could be put on a covered stretcher and taken over to the front and outside of the prison if it was known that there was relatives there ready to pick up the body and take it away for burial. If there were no relatives around, the body during that day would be taken to the Fremantle Cemetery and buried in unconsecrated ground. 43 men were hanged here, and one female. She was hanged in 1909 for the murder of her three stepsons whom she poisoned. First recorded hanging of a white person was of John Gavin, who was 15 years old. He wasn't hanged here, however, he was hanged at the old ramble. The first hangings of all were Aboriginals on Rottnest Island, where they had a big Aboriginal prison. And they were hanged without going through a court of law. They did something wrong. Anyway, they went to the back of the prison and hanged and buried it. <coughs> last one to be hanged here was in 1964. And the last one in Australia was in 1967 in Victoria. In between 64 and 84, however, in this state, they still had the death penalty. In that 20 years, if you were convicted and sentenced to death, you were put in the death cells over at New Division and you stayed in there till the government and the court put, put around to commuting your death sentence to life in prison, which in those days was around about 30 years. I don't know what it was I have no idea. I know. England's about 10 years. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, mean, I don't see the point in having a life sentence if you're going to be out in 10 years. Yeah, we're going to have a bonus tour, but unfortunately not today. <laughs> <laughs>